Uh, good morning and welcome to the uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. Uh, we look forward to this uh, very exciting hearing. Um, and, uh, uh, and we think that it is of historic importance. Um, Fifty years ago, uh, the launch of Sputnik challenged America to build a better scientific community. Today, skyrocketing gas prices and the threat of global warming challenge us to build green communities. Green communities offer relief from high gasoline prices and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They employ renewable energy, uh, rely on energy efficient buildings, and adopt smart growth principles to reduce the distances between destinations and foster a diverse local economy. Through these actions, green communities reduce vehicle emissions, lower energy demand, and reduce the need for costly road and energy infrastructure. The result is reduced global warming emissions and lower taxes. The growing demand for green communities overwhelms supply. With gasoline prices at over $4 per gallon and a housing crisis hurting many areas of the country, young professionals, smaller families, and aging populations seek the smart growth lifestyle in increasing numbers. Despite this shift, local and federal law can make it simpler to build on whatever open land is available, scattering people, workplaces, and resources far apart. This hearing will examine whether the government can help communities return to a lifestyle that does not depend on long drives to work and hassle-filled drives to schools, grocery stores, and shopping. Smart growth communities were once the norm across the country. Like many of you, I have lived for years in a green community without even realizing. When I grew up in Malden, Massachusetts, I walked to school. We took the bus around town. My parents did not buy a car until I was nine years old. Hard to think that Malden was green when we would uh, take field trips to find a park. But the truth is that close-in experience was typical of many towns and cities in the 20th century America. How communities achieve smart growth principles varies widely. The Select Committee is fortunate to have two very different examples of attempts to build successful green communities. The rural commun community of Greensburg, Kansas was destroyed by a tornado last May. Now it is rebuilding using the highest green building standards, developing a wind power economy, and retaining the businesses and neighbors integral to a close-knit community. Rural smart growth may not be a, f a phrase heard often, but it should be. The small town principles of walking to school, 10 minute driving commute, and shopping at local stores are identical to those of urban smart communities like Portland, Oregon. Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi represents the future of green communities. They are working with the private sector engineers from MIT and American architects to build a city that will be a net exporter of energy. Mazdar will incorporate basic services like schools and libraries with carless streets, photovoltaic awnings, and an academic and commercial center focusing on the latest energy technology. Despite having a century's supply of oil, Abu Dhabi has chosen to invest in a new clean energy, climate conscious economy by building a smart growth, zero net energy city. Make no mistake, Mazdar is our new Sputnik. It should be a wake-up call to America and a challenge to each of us. The city of tomorrow, creating the technology of the future, is now underway in another country. We must rise to the challenge of building smart growth, energy efficient communities. We have the scientific ability to do so. And as the story of Greensburg will demonstrate, we also have the heart and the American spirit to make it happen. My time uh, has expired for an opening statement. We now turn and recognize the ranking member of the committee, uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, most communities want to grow, and I'll bet if you ask governors, mayors, and council members of these communities how they want to grow, I'm sure nearly all would say they want to grow smartly. After all, it's only common sense for community leaders to use the most up-to-date planning methods and ideas. 
Today's hearing will highlight many smart ideas that can help communities grow bigger and more prosperous without subjecting themselves to some of the problems that are often associated with large urban areas, such as traffic, air pollution, and congestion. However, while some of the concepts to be presented today could simply be described as common sense, others might be described as a waste of money. While reducing greenhouse gas emissions is a good policy, it is a policy that should be properly balanced with economic realities. The testimony of Gregory Cohen, the President and CEO of the American Highway Users Alliance, shows us that many smart growth policies don't have to be expensive at all. For example, improved signal timing and intelligent transportation systems are among the most cost-effective ways to reduce greenhouse gases, and I welcome Mr. Cohen here today. Where feasible and practical, I would encourage communities to enact some of these smart growth principles based on their unique needs. One global warming principle that I've consistently advocated is that policies need to produce tangible environmental benefits. Local elected leaders will be pressured to adopt many smart growth policies, but they should diligently research exactly how these changes might affect these communities. In many cases, there might not be very much bang for the buck, if any at all. Also, I do not think the federal government should dictate the local government how they should grow. Managing growth is a local decision, and local elected leaders should be free to take local conditions under consideration while take, without taking burdensome one-size-fits-all regulations from the federal government. I do believe in local home rule. And in my state, the Wisconsin Constitution gives local home rule to incorporated municipalities. One argument that will be forwarded today is that smart growth will help reduce reliance on oil, presumably leading to lower gas prices in the future. I don't dispute that reducing demand for gas will help lower the price. However, people should not confuse smart growth planning for policy that will help lower gas prices in the foreseeable future. The American people want solutions to today's high gas prices. They need relief now. And while this hearing will help lay out a vision for the future, Americans want us working today on policies that will help reduce gas prices in the near term. By dropping restrictions on domestic oil exploration, Congress could take the first big step towards making gasoline more affordable in the U.S. and reducing our reliance on foreign oil. This, of course, is not the only thing that Congress can do, but it should be the first thing that we do. Yet common sense principles like this don't seem to be anywhere on the Democratic majority's radar. Of course, there are many long-term steps that Congress can take to reduce our reliance on foreign oil and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. One of these is to encourage smart growth where feasible. But today's first priority should be to increase domestic supplies of oil and gas. And I would hope that the Speaker and the majority start focusing the House on this important priority. I thank the gentleman and yield back the balance of my time. Great. I thank the gentleman. And uh, now I will recognize the gentleman from uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize that there isn't a witness uh, from uh, Oregon here today. Uh, the group from the metropolitan area actually are uh, traveling in, uh, in Europe, uh, exchanging views. Um, but I, I think we'll be able to deal with some of these elements. I uh, commend uh, you and the staff for the excellent uh, memorandum that I think uh, lays these issues out. Uh, we got into the smart growth movement uh, in Oregon at first to deal with legislation to help uh, protect our farmland. But from there, we found that there were a wide variety of other benefits uh, by uh, strengthening communities, uh, the things that you talked about in the smart growth community that you grew up in, we got away from. And unfortunately, dumb growth is alive and well. Uh, across the United States today. Our congressional delegation just had to fight the federal government that was going to take the INS office and move it out of the heart of the central city, 12 miles out into the suburbs where it wasn't even uh, accessed by bus. Um, that um, uh, but hopefully um, there's an opportunity for the federal government to learn from this as well. But it does make a difference today. Uh, our local residents are 
uh, 10 times more likely to bicycle to work than the national average. They drive 20 percent less than residents of other major metropolitan areas, saving by some estimates up to $2,500 a year uh, in transportation costs. It hasn't resulted in our not growing. Indeed, our metropolitan area grew by 85 percent between 1986 and, and 2006. We just didn't expand the carbon footprint as cost. And ironically, the homes have actually maintained value, as is represented in your uh, memo. They actually were increasing in value rather than decreasing in this last year. Uh, this is important business. And while I agree with my good friend that we don't want a one-size-fits-all federal prescription. The fact is that the federal government, through its tax policies, transportation policies, and its stupid uh, uh, infrastructure decisions with some of its own facilities, has a profound effect on this. And for us to get it right with transportation, with energy, with tax, can help set a framework that will make a huge difference. And last but not least, the federal government itself should lead by example as the largest manager of infrastructure in the world, the largest consumer of energy, uh, and uh, the largest landlord and uh, property owner. I appreciate having this hearing, and I do apologize that the Oregonians are uh, off proselytizing in other parts of the world, but Mr. Walden and I will try and step into the gap. Right, the gentleman's time has expired, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, uh, I think Oregon has been a real leader, both in terms of uh, laying out a plan for uh, best uses of its great resources, and certainly in the urban areas, uh, for dealing with growth in a, in a thoughtful way although not altogether without controversy from time to time, as my colleague from Portland can tell us. Um, but clearly in those areas, uh, having mass transit that works, uh, being on the uh, innovative side of, of the transportation equation has made a lot of sense. And I've, uh, in the legislature and elsewhere, supported uh, a lot of those uh, transportation initiatives because you have to be able to move people in a congested area in an efficient way, and that makes sense. Now, I represent a district that's 70,000 square miles. I got counties where there's one person for every nine miles of power line. You know, we have a problem making sure that Walmart moms and diesel driving truck dads can get access to fuel they can afford. And, uh, and, and while we need to do these things that help in the urban areas and, and, and need to foster uh, renewable energy resources, and, and my district's home to a lot of wind energy, enormous geothermal energy potential, um, great solar potential. We're working on a project there. Um, I haven't seen too many uh, diesel trucks being powered by windmills, at least not yet. Maybe we'll get to a plug-in hybrid version that will work um, down the road, and I hope we do. But right now, we need to access our own natural resources like every other industrialized country in the world, and that's why I've supported lifting the ban on uh, outer continental shelf drilling. Um, I, I think it's uh, a real hardship being uh, foisted on top of Americans that we don't access our own oil and gas reserves. It's long overdue. We're paying an enormous price for it now, and that needs to change. And I, I just look forward to the day where at least we could have a vote on the floor on that issue. Then we could actually fund the services that we need in this country and perhaps be a uh, uh, not a, a debtor nation, if you will, but, but rather maybe create our own sort of sovereign wealth fund. Uh, that wouldn't be a bad thing, pay down our debt a little bit. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the topic today. I think that's going to be real good to hear about, and we've got other issues we need to attend to as well. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I think this is a, a, a critically important uh, hearing. Um, as, a, as the former mayor of uh, Missouri's largest city, uh, I and other mayors have, have bragged uh, over the years about the fact that Kansas City, Missouri is a city of 322 square miles. We bragged that you could place the entire city of St. Louis inside our city limits three times or San Francisco 30 times. Uh, we have more circumferential highway miles per capita than any city in the nation. We bragged about it. The truth of the matter is uh, that's one of the worst things that's going on in our, our community, continuing to expand the city. Uh, it hurts the taxpayers because when we uh, provide tax increment financing for a project uh, in the suburbs and when we do uh, uh, some kind of tax abatement for a major development, 
we're actually causing uh, the, the use of utilities to rise because it's the, the further out that, the, that uh, people move from the generators, uh, the more costly and the more waste. Uh, and we don't have a, a, a major transportation system. We have no uh, light rail. We, we have uh, uh, buses. Uh, the, 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 the sad thing is that we have track running all through the city. We, at one time, had a, a, a very good rail system up until the 1950s when the bus companies came in and uh, convinced city leaders that the bus was the vehicle of the future, uh, almost like a flash garden uh, rocket. And so we <coughs> paved over all of the, the rail. Uh, and I think mayors around the uh, country now realize that uh, the, the people in the past had it right. There, there was a time when if you lived in the central city, uh, which was also surrounded by walls, uh, you were, of course, a big time resident. If you lived in the suburbs outside the walls, uh, you were not only uh, 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 in peril, because if there was an attack, you're going to get hurt first, uh, but you also were not considered to be a part of the major community. We've got to go back to that, and I'm very, very much interested in getting your take on some of the major issues facing cities, uh, uh, even as we sit here today. And decisions are being made in metropolitan uh, uh, areas all over the country uh, that could use your, the benefit of your wisdom. Thank you very much. Uh, I yield back no time. I don't have any time remaining. I thank the gentleman. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I comment on the topic of the day, I just want to observe that uh, our distinguished members on the other side of the aisle seem to have read the same memo that all Republicans are reading from uh, lately, which is to blame Democrats for high gas prices. It's, it's interesting when our President George W. Bush said, back when oil was $50 a barrel, that there was, from now on, no more need for an incentive for oil companies to drill. Uh, yet they have 9,700 plus leases that they have already leased in the lower 48 and adjacent offshore leases in excess of 26, 26 million acres of land that's been environmentally cleared, ready for metal to meet uh, earth. And uh, for some reason, they are not drilling on land they already own the right to drill on. Uh, the two cases in particular offshore that have been well publicized where a Republican governor, Jeb Bush in Florida and Arnold Schwarzenegger in California have been fighting offshore uh, don't get mentioned nearly as often as the fact that somehow we or our speaker are standing in the way of the oil companies doing that which they already have least the right to do on our national lands. Uh, today's hearing, however, on smart growth speaks to what I would believe is one of the fundamental keys in our ability to confront, confront climate change. Um, I know for a fact that most of the commuters that I know in the 19th District of New York would love to be doing things other than watching their life go by three car lengths at a time in gridlock traffic. The way we live takes a toll on, on our environment, degrades our public health and the quality of life. And the good news is that contrary to widely held perceptions, we can usher in a smarter, more sustainable future without forcing people to make radical decisions or extreme changes in their daily lives. And I yield back, Mr. Chair. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll try to be brief. I'm kind of losing my voice here <laughs> from congestion and pollution in the air. <laughs> but I want to thank the Chairman for having this meeting and for inviting um, our panelists here today. You know, in California, in the San Gabriel Valley, where, uh, where I live and reside, there are some innovative, uh, smart growth projects going on. And in some cases, the federal government has been helpful. In some cases, they haven't. I wish they would be more helpful, especially when it comes to transportation and when we're looking at other modes of uh, communities that are transit dependent, more so than in other communities. And I'm talking particularly about low income African American and Hispanic uh, residents. And in my district, one project that we're looking to hopefully seek funding from the federal government is a metro line that would go right through my district, that would help take students to classes, that would help eventually even take people possibly from LA, Pasadena, downtown, all the way to LAX. But we're looking at some support from the federal government and our local authorities to do that. 
that. That's something that I think is smart and wise. We've invested in our communities. They've already developed transit centers that are ready to go to accept this project. But now it's just the federal government that has to say, yes, we're going to get behind it. And Lord knows the pollution in our communities is very, very bad and gotten worse in Los Angeles County and the San Bernardino area. So we know that um, there have to be met better modes for us, particularly with the cost of gasoline now in my district about four sixty nine a gallon. I filled up uh, a quarter of my tank, $25 for four gallons. And I thought, it doesn't hurt me, but it does hurt a lot of the residents that I represent who only make win minimum wage in the uh, eastern San Gabriel Valley. So I would just say that uh, we need to have new remedies, new ideas, and we have to get people to use other modes of transportation, whether it is bikes, whether it's skateboards or whatever, we've got to do something to make it more uh, user-friendly for people to use different uh, modes of transportation. And I yield back the balance of my time. Great. And we thank the gentlelady. And uh, all time for opening statements from the select committee members has been completed. And now we're going to turn to our very distinguished panel. Uh, and our first witness, David Goldberg, who is the Director of Communications of Smart Growth America. Prior to joining Smart Growth America, Mr. Goldberg was a Loeb Fellow at Harvard University and a journalist covering uh, uh, issues for the Atlantic uh, Constitution. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thanks very much. Am I audible? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner, and members of the committee. Thank you all for holding such an important hearing on such a, a critical set of interrelated issues and for inviting us to testify on the opportunity to harness the profound changes we see happening in the marketplace right now and for, to, to the benefit of energy independence, climate stability, and America's prosperity. Um, with your indulgence, I'll summarize my written testimony, which I respectfully submit for the record. It will be included in the record. Our nation today faces a number of very difficult challenges, and the committee has taken on two of the greatest <laughs> challenges, over-dependence on high-priced oil and climate change. But Smart Growth America comes today with encouraging news. We can significantly reduce our nation's dependence on oil and shrink our carbon footprint while helping Americans avoid high gas prices and the time they spend in traffic, merely by meeting the growing demand for conveniently located homes in walkable neighborhoods and by serving those neighborhoods with good public transit. Even better news, we don't have to wait for someone to invent green neighborhoods. We have the know-how right now to build them, and we have since the dawn of, of civilization. It is a low-cost or no-cost solution to oil dependence and climate change that comes with multiple benefits for our pocketbooks, for our environment, for our quality of life. Communities and private sector developers across the country have rediscovered this approach to building in recent years, creating neighborhoods and towns according to 10 principles and town plans according to 10 principles that have come to be labeled as smart growth. I won't read the whole list here. You can see it in my written testimony. The label itself, smart growth, is not important. The goal is what's important, and that is to help people find homes and communities where they can accomplish more while driving less, meaning they can spend less and they can emit less greenhouse gas. Creating walkable green neighborhoods requires building a mix of housing types, standalone houses, apartments, or townhouses, within a short distance of shopping and job opportunities. It means reusing existing buildings and developed areas, whether those be former industrial sites, declining shopping centers, or blighted neighborhoods. It also means using green building techniques when we build new things. It means providing multiple ways to get around public transit, in addition to complete streets that serve cars, walking, and biking. And above all, it means involving people, the people who, will, who live and will live in these places, in planning ahead for their community's development. The demand for homes and places that meet these principles, the neighborhoods where daily life requires significantly less gas consumption, has been growing for many years, several years now, but it's exploding literally as we speak. Just yesterday, CNN, The Wall Street Journal, and The Los Angeles Times all reported on this phenomenon. CNN reported, you can find it on their website, uh, that, quote, while the foreclosure epidemic has left communities across the United States overrun with unoccupied houses and overgrown grass, Underneath the chaos, another trend is quietly emerging that over the next several decades could change the face of suburban American life as we know it. The story notes that 40% of home seekers say they want to live in walkable urban neighborhoods. A consumer survey that we, Smart Growth America, did with the National Association of Realtors a couple of years ago found that six in 10 prospective buyers are looking for close-knit neighborhoods close to work. 
The Wall Street Journal yesterday also had an interesting story headlined, Demographic Changes, High Gasoline Prices May Hasten Demand for Urban Living. And that story noted that, quote, transportation is the second biggest household expense after housing. Distant suburbs where housing growth was predicated on cheap gas have experienced the greatest decline in home values. The LA Times story quoted a Pasadena real estate agent who noted that, quote, compared to two years ago, home seekers are staying in closer proximity to their jobs. They're more focused on the neighborhood they want. Unless one conclude this is only a big city phenomenon, Maine's leading newspaper a couple of days ago had a front page story headlined, Mainers begin making life changes that could slow urban sprawl to a crawl. And this is in Maine, which is not exactly a, a heavily urbanized state. Families in areas with good transit and walkable neighborhoods pay less than 10% of their income for transportation on average, while families living in areas with fewer transportation uh, options pay upwards of 25% of their income, and often much more than that. Access to transit can reduce the need to have a car, uh, and which would save a family $6,000 a year just on that, and a 30% reduction in transportation-related carbon emissions, whether or not they have owned the car, simply by driving less. The measures I've talked about here and in my written testimony apply in towns large and small, in cities, in metro areas, and even rural areas. For smaller cities, this can mean reclaiming existing main streets and ending the tendency to hollow out our towns, our business districts, and spread the development across the countryside. In larger cities, it can mean providing millions more Americans with more transportation and living options. Uh, how's my time right now? Uh, Americans who live within a half mile of if, rail if transit. You could, uh, if you could summarize, please. Yes. Americans who live within a half mile of rail transit drive significantly less by their own choice. On average, one third use that transit to commute, and they drive a third less than other people do. The, the upshot here is that we need to build more homes within reach of existing transit, and we need to expand public transportation to more areas. And I hope that during question, I'll have a, an opportunity to expand on some of these thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldberg, very much. Our second witness is Steve Winkleman, who is the Transportation Director of the Center for Clean Air Policy. Uh, Mr. Winkleman, along with Mr. Goldberg, is an author of the book uh, Growing Cooler, a recent and comprehensive report on smart growth and global warming. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, members of the committee, good morning. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Steve Winkleman. I'm the director of the Transportation and Adaptation Programs at the Center for Clean Air Policy, also called CCAP, a Washington, D.C. and Brussels-based environmental think tank. I respectfully request that my full statement may be part of the record. Without objection, I will. I'll summarize it now. CCAP helps governments at all levels design and implement energy and climate solutions that balance economic and environmental considerations. CCAP conducts technical and economic analyses and facilitates dialogue among stakeholders from government, industry, and environmental groups to craft practical and effective solutions. For example, CCAP's VMT and Climate Policy Dialogue brings together four secretaries of transportation from four different states, two directors of metropolitan planning organizations, members of local government, federal agencies, industry, and environmental groups to advance smart growth policy in climate, within climate policy and to integrate climate considerations into transportation policy. If you could go to the next slide, please. Transportation sector CO2 emissions account for almost one-third of U.S. CO2 emissions and are growing rapidly. CCAP characterizes transportation emissions as a three-legged stool, as you can see in the graphic here. The first leg is vehicle efficiency, the second, fuel characteristics, and the third, vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, which is a measure of how much we drive each year and the wonky acronym of the day. Energy and climate policy discussions to date have focused exclusively on the first two legs of the stool, vehicles and fuels. With my testimony this morning and the full written testimony, I aim to demonstrate that it's both necessary and beneficial to address the third leg of the stool, VMT. As indicated in this graph, you go to the next slide, transportation CO2 emissions, depicted here in blue, are 25% above 1990 levels and climate protection will require reductions to 30% below 1990 levels by 2030. That's the orange line in the graphic. If you go to the next slide, we can see that the 2007 energy bill, with its new standards for vehicle efficiency and fuel requirements, would reduce transportation CO2 emissions to 20% below 1990 levels in 2030. You see the blue line is now on top of the orange line, right on path to climate protection. However, if you go to the next slide, 
and watch the red line, the U.S. Department of Energy forecasts a 50% increase in driving, bringing CO2 emissions back up to current levels and wiping out the benefits from the energy bill. Climate protection will clearly require reductions on all three legs of the stool. We cannot afford to ignore VMT. I'm a co-author of the book Growing Cooler, The Evidence on Urban Development and Climate Change, in which we review the empirical evidence on the relationships between land use development patterns and travel activity. We find that people drive fewer miles in places where things are closer together and where they have more travel options, such as walking and transit. In my written testimony, I provide some examples from places with successful and promising policies for slowing VMT growth. The Sacramento region is especially compelling because they have calculated that smart growth policies can reduce infrastructure costs by $9 billion by 2050 and reduce consumer fuel expenditures by more than $600 million per year. With high gas prices and a robust federal climate policy debate, the timing has never been better to increase travel choices thereby lowering consumer fuel expenditures and reducing transportation emissions. CCAP has therefore developed a policy proposal for a federal incentive program that requires state and local governments to develop goals to slow VMT growth and greenhouse gas emissions. Allowance values from a cap and trade system would be used to fund goal development and implementation. Importantly, CCAPs believe that there is no one-size-fits-all approach and that solutions must be developed locally, not dictated by the federal government. We anticipate that a diversity of measures applicable to urban, suburban, and rural areas, ranging from infill development, transit improvements, signal timing improvements, and intermodal freight will be required. CCAP recommends a bottom-up discovery process in which states and local governments conduct scenario analyses and engage stakeholders to determine goals appropriate to local conditions. Finally, CCAP sees federal climate policy as setting the stage for climate-friendly transportation policy what we refer to as green tea. Federal transportation policy actually contributes to VMT growth because key funding formulas reward VMT and fuel consumption. The challenge is how to ensure the next $300 billion we spend on transportation infrastructure actually builds upon the savings in the energy bill instead of wiping them out. The new federal efforts that CCAP recommends to improve travel choices for all Americans can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, lower consumer fuel expenditures, and strengthen the economy. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Winkleman, very much. Our next uh, witness, Gregory Cohen, is the President and CEO of the American Highway Users Alliance, which is an, al an alliance of businesses and nonprofit corporations dedicated to uh, highway funding and maintenance. Uh, prior to joining the alliance, he served as on, the, on the staff of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey and members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate being allowed the opportunity to provide an alternative view in the spirit of debate. And I'm honored to, to be here to present testimony on highway needs, land use, planning, and greenhouse gas emissions. A recent national survey of 1,000 likely voters found the following. 88% feel the congestion relief is needed. 76% see cars, roads, and bridges as a benefit to society and 69% say congestion relief is a better environmental policy than policies aimed at reducing driving. We urge this committee to, provide, to promote greenhouse gas solutions that are cost effective and provide benefits to the overwhelming majority of people whose transportation mode of choice is the personal automobile. The IPCC recommends finding solutions that reduce emissions at a cost of $50 or less per ton. By minimizing the cost of carbon removed, we believe you'll find solutions that are effective and fair, rather than based on ideology, the latest planning fad, or special interest lobbying. Among surface transportation modes, highway investments have a dominant role to play, both in reducing wasted emissions and fuel. Traffic congestion results in nearly 3 billion gallons of wasted fuel each year. With each passing year that it's not addressed, that waste grows. Yet over 20 years, a strategic con congestion relief program could reduce on-site carbon emissions by an average of 77 percent, save 40 billion gallons of fuel, and reduce carbon emissions by 390 million tons. Although VMT would increase, carbon emissions would be reduced. This demonstrates that VMT is not a valid measure of greenhouse gas nor pollutant emissions. Instead of attempting to reduce travel, 
a national policy to reduce the time wasted in traffic congestion would be an effective win-win, both for people and the environment. Some have proposed that the United States should make smart growth a national land use policy. Some even believe that the federal government should try to direct people where to live and how to travel, and particularly how to commute to work. Yet emissions from commutes in cars and light trucks represent only one-sixth of transportation emissions and only about 5% of the total U.S. carbon emissions. Even a tripling of commuter transit, and I, I don't mean to speak against transit, but even a tripling of commuter transit would only reduce those emissions by a fraction of percent. Some have suggested that EPA should take over DOT's role improving transportation plans to ensure that they promote smart growth concepts and reduce VMT. But such a plan would uh, uh, stop federally funded highway projects that already have been delayed in many cases by a decade or more and create serious problems to freight mobility, deficient bridges, aging pavements, snarling congestion, and most importantly, safety improvements. In fact, some travel reduction ideas actually increase road congestion and wasted emissions. For example, smart growth advocates have found that doubling an area's density would reduce per capita VMT by 20 percent. Thus, twice as many people would drive 80 percent as much. Clearly, the result is more traffic, more congestion, increased travel time, and even some serious unintended consequences. EMS response times would slow, trucking logistics would be more unreliable, and road rage would increase. But there are solutions that are more promising. Along with congestion relief, the great opportunity for mobile source emission reductions relies on fuel and vehicles technology. Even if VMT could reduce, be reduced dramatically, would it still be necessary in a future of low or zero emission vehicles? With the new national CAFE standards and new congressionally authorized tax incentives, these technological solutions would allow for increased mobility and all of the economic and quality of life benefits that travel brings. Recent research suggests that hybrid vehicles will soon yield lower greenhouse gas emissions per passenger than transit. These new technologies are another win-win for people and the environment. When the House pursues greenhouse gas legislation, we ask that highway programs are treated fairly. After all, it will be highway users paying the increased fuel cross costs associated with a carbon tax, a cap-and-trade program, or a fuel tax. One idea is that a carbon or fuel tax paid by highway users at the pump be deposited in the Highway Trust Fund and used for projects, regardless of mode, that reduce carbon emissions cost effectively. Like a tax, a cap and trade proposal would also increase fuel costs paid by highway users. And some have suggested that cap and trade credits only be used for transit, bike pass, and VMT reduction projects. We're not aware of any data analysis that justifies this massive diversion of motorist money. It appears to be simply a giveaway to special interests. Reality, rather than rhetoric, should be the basis for policy. In conclusion, we're ready to help reduce carbon emissions. We look forward to supporting congressional action to reduce traffic congestion and invest in fuel and vehicle technology. But we implore this committee to fully consider and reject the unintended negative consequences of a nationally mandated land use or VMT reduction scheme. Instead of trying to socially engineer behaviors, let's provide the win-win solutions that allow people the freedom to live, work, and travel as they wish. Embracing this freedom rather than restricting it preserves the American dream of opportunity and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen, very much. Our next witness, Dr. Sultan uh, uh, Al Jabur, uh, is the CEO of the Mazdar Initiative in Abu Dhabi of the United Arab Emirates. We thank you, sir. We thank you for coming that long distance to testify before the Select Committee today. Welcome. Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify on such an important issue. Sustainable development is essential to the United Arab Emirates and to Abu Dhabi in particular. It is integral to my company and personally important to me. Today's hearing helps illustrate our belief that aggressively addressing these fundamental issues can help bring communities together, even those as diverse as Abu Dhabi and Greensburg, Kansas. Let me begin with a brief overview. In April 2006, the government of Abu Dhabi launched the Mazdar Initiative to establish a new economic development program that is entirely dedicated to sustainable energy. Mazdar is, multifaceted under Mazdar is a multifaceted undertaking to address future energy-related issues. The government of Abu Dhabi has committed $15 billion to the Mazdar Initiative, and we are leveraging additional funds through partnerships and private sector. 
Masdar includes investments in current technologies, new solar manufacturing plants, renewable energy infrastructure, and carbon management projects. We are creating a one-of-a-kind research institute in Abu Dhabi and developing Mazda City, the world's first carbon-neutral zero-waste city. Given the subject of the hearing, I want to focus on Mazda City, which is really the centerpiece of the entire program. Imagine a city built in, in the desert that will house 50,000 people, technology companies, a research institute, R&D facilities, light manufacturing plants, stores, schools, and libraries, all powered by renewable energy. There will be no cars. People will move around on personal rapid transit, light rail, seg segways, and bikes. A net of photovoltaic collectors will create shade along narrow streets. Green spaces will be fed with purified, recycled water. We expect the city will be the blueprint for cities of the future. We will do this by completely re-engineering the way modern cities are built and use energy. In planning the city, we did not look at the cost of energy per kilowatt hour. Instead, we looked at the cost per, per square meter. Integrated design is a core element of our planning. It will help reduce energy and water demand to unprecedented levels. Specifically, Mazda City will require only 200 megawatts of power instead of the 800 megawatts that are normally required by a conventional city of the same size. Desalinated water consumptions will drop from 20,000 cubic meters per day to only 8,000. And through intensive reuse and recycling, we will eliminate the need for millions of square meters of landfill. Mazda City will be more than just an efficient, environmentally friendly space. It will be a platform for long-term innovation. Residents of the city will be part, part of a community that includes global leaders in business, academia, and finance who can collaborate on a common goal. When I travel, the most frequent question I get asked is why? Why would a major oil producing country proactively seek a key role in the alternative energy space? The answer is simple. First, we want to reduce our own carbon footprint. The UAE ratified the Kyoto Protocol, and we must be prepared to meet future commitments to reduce emissions while ensuring continuous growth. Second, as part of our diversification and long-term economic strategy, Abu Dhabi seeks to be a developer and an exporter of technology rather than being an importer. We will continue to be a leader in the global energy markets, but go beyond hydrocarbons. We believe we can act as a catalyst to encourage nations with greater human technological and institutional resources to accelerate the adoption of clean and sustainable technology. We also see this as an opportunity to be a part of a growing business sector. According to the International Energy Agency, the world's energy requirements could grow by as much as 50% or more by 2030. We want to help meet these needs. That is why we are taking these proactive steps. Finally, I want to inform the committee about the significant contribution of American innovators. MIT is working with us to establish the world's first research-driven graduate university focused on sustainable energy, which is called the Masdar Institute of Science and Technology. Investments by our Mazda Clean Tech Fund include US-based Dorotherm, Enertech, Halosource, Nanogram Corporation, Segway, Heliovolt, and Solargenics. Colorado-based CH2 Omhel serves as a program manager for the overall development of Mazda City, and there is more American innovators that are very much involved with the Mazda initiative. Things are happening fast at Mazda. We broke ground in, uh, in, uh, in Mazda City in February 2008. Students are being enrolled in, in MIT, in, in MIST. We invite you to come to Abu Dhabi and to see it all firsthand. I welcome our American friends and partners to join us. Thank you again for inviting me here today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you uh, uh, very much. And now we'll move to our final witness, who is Steve Hewitt, who is the city administrator of Greensburg, Kansas. When this rural town in southwest Kansas was destroyed by a tornado last May, they chose to rebuild, not in the cheapest way, but the smartest way. Mr. Hewitt helped lead the charge to rebuild using energy efficient building technology and green community principles. Greensburg intends to transform the wind that destroyed it into the power that will rebuild it. They recently received a Sustainable Cities Award from the Financial Times and the Urban Land Institute um, edging uh, out uh, all of the other communities in America. So that's quite an, a tribute to you. Uh, and whenever you are ready, Mr. Hewitt, uh, please begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, distinguished members of the Select Committee. Uh, I am Steve Hewitt, the City Administrator of Greensburg, Kansas. Can you move the microphone in a little bit closer, please? Absolutely. Again, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak today. 
I first want to start off with a small video about our community. That's the only way I know how to describe it. When I drove into Greensburg, it was just sad. Just the devastation everywhere was horrible. I used to say, uh, make yourself at home. Uh, but where is home? I don't know where it's at anymore. Uh, uh. It'll come back. It will. It doesn't look like it right now with all the devastation, but it will. We are starting from the beginning, we are creating a town, and to build it energy effectively and to rebuild it green. There's definitely a future here for my family, and I know I'll always come back here because, you know, this is my home. I know the spirit of Greensburg is still going to stay the same. I think that we owe our children the concepts of green design. Commence with the groundbreaking. Greensburg has the opportunity to be the first model green community in the world. We're building a better town, we're building a better future, and I think it's great. Although you drive through and you see the devastation, if you'll dream a little bit, we have an opportunity here to show the world what we can do as a country, what we can do as a state, as a community. Out of crisis uh, emerges opportunity. As you saw, May 4th of 2007, an F5 tornado that was nearly two miles wide ripped through a community that was approximately 1,500 residents and destroyed nearly everything from the schools to downtown to government buildings to infrastructure. Before the storm, this community was a, a community trying to get by, a rural community in western Kansas, basically struggling to make sure it, it can live and survive every day. What has happened since May 4th of 2007 is an opportunity. Through detailed planning, we, have, we now have an opportunity to plan a new community. Through planning, we are blessed with an opportunity to create a strong community devoted, devoted to family, fostering business, working together for future generations. Future generations and future decisions will, be, will come directly from our planning. We are focused on goals such as community, family, prosperity, environment, affordability, growth, renewal, water, health, energy, wind, and our environment. We see this as an economic development tool as well. I cannot compete as a small town with much larger cities around our area. However, though, we see sustainability and a direction to build a community green as an opportunity to foster new businesses and green-collar jobs something that we feel is smart. Building back a community fiscally responsible and being smart with your tax dollars is building green. Sometimes it's a, a struggle, but it's a smart thing to do. Good decisions in infrastructure, buildings, and an energy plan. We want to be 100% renewable 100% 100 of the time. We have a wind energy plan that will, com that will feed our energy in our community. And then we will buy energy from the grid when wind is not blowing that is renewable 100% of the time. We think that's innovative. To, sh to prove our point, our city council passed a resolution that was devoted to making sure all our community buildings are built at the highest level of sustainability. We feel like our opportunity is to show the world that building a community smart, with walkability, connecting our community, and sustainability is the right decision. Tax dollars. It's smart for our future generations. Productivity, energy, health, it's the right thing to do. We hope our decision to go green and to build a sustainable community will help future communities hopefully do the same thing. In conclusion, we are trying to be a model sustainable community that creates opportunities, opportunities that didn't happen before, that do happen now. 
we accept this opportunity, we're blessed with it, and we hope to build a community that's better in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt, very much, and we thank uh, all of our witnesses. And now we're going to turn to questions from the uh, select committee members, and the chair will recognize himself. Mr. Hewitt, uh, you have brought us one of the most inspirational stories that I think Congress has ever heard. Rather than leaving, the community has decided to stay and to rebuild and to create a model for the United States and for the rest of the world in using green technologies. Um, what is the um, role that the federal government is playing in your uh, redevelopment of the community using these green principles? Well, un unfortunately, um, when building a community back, it's, it's expensive. And when you make smart decisions, the upfront costs are obviously a percentage higher. But the long-term savings are, are evident, and you can see those. We have been told by some agencies um, that they will not fund our rebuilding efforts at the highest level of sustainability. It doesn't make sense to them be a little bit more moderate. Unfortunately, uh, that's not our direction, so we have gaps. We're still going to fill those gaps. Uh, we'd like to partner up with uh, the government and so that <coughs> as communities rebuild or try to grow, that any tax dollars they use, it's a smart decision to build it sustainable. So what you're saying is that there are some federal agencies that don't want to help you to meet, reach the uh, platinum level, the best level of energy efficiency in the buildings that you're constructing. Is that correct? That's correct. It, let me be very clear is that the government has been uh, very helpful and they'll continue to be helpful in the future in, in our rebuilding efforts. However, our decision to go to build platinum, lead platinum, um, the highest level you can build in sustainability has come with resistance from certain agencies. What I would recommend to the uh, members of the select committee is that we write a letter to those federal agencies and we urge them to help Greensburg reach the highest levels of efficiency so that it can be a model to the rest of the country. And I would uh, urge the members, I'm going to circulate a letter so that we tell the federal agencies that if, if we have a community willing to pay this huge uh, price in terms of their personal commitment after their community is destroyed, the least that we can do as a federal government is to help them to reach uh, the standards, the best standards that our country uh, can uh, provide. And uh, if they're willing to be the leader, I think that we should have a federal government willing to follow. So I, I'm going to uh, write that letter and circulate it to the members so that uh, we send it off to the federal agencies. Um, what, uh, what has been the most extraordinary result, Mr. Hewitt, of uh, this decision that you've made to rebuild Greensburg as the greenest community in the United States? Well, I think the fact that a community that was struggling and was unsure, it would be very easy to pick up your, uh, your insurance check and move to a community that was a community. There is no community. Um, if, if you, as you can see, it was completely destroyed. But we have all ages of, and, and all levels of different people that want to come back. They're invested in their community. They want to see it rebuilt. Uh, one example is a, uh, a few different senior couples that uh, they're retired. It would be very easy for them to leave town and go to a community where their kids or grandkids were at. It's exciting to know that they've committed to come back to the community and build a home that's energy efficient and green. There's also young, young students that are now talking about with new opportunities in economic development and green jobs, they want to go to school and come back and work in their community. It really is changing the face of rural America. Rural America has struggles because of being away from um, supplies and the cost of fuel. Uh, but we still believe it's the right thing in the right direction because long-term savings is our, our main goal. And, and what, do you, what lessons do you think other rural communities in America can learn from Greensburg's experience? I, I believe that the biggest thing is that you're, as a community, your community, you decide the direction. Through community planning, and I believe smart growth is, is evident of that, that you decide the direction and you decide how you want to see your community rebuilt. By taking the decisions we've done from, you can have community wind, you can have renewable energy to help power your community. You can use 
sustainable designs in your government buildings as well as your schools, your hospitals, so that you're not relying on so many outside sources so that you can shop local, you can spend your tax dollars locally. And, 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 and I think that can help revitalize rural America, which is struggling so much. Well, I thank you, uh, Mr. Hewitt, for your leadership and for everyone's leadership in uh, Greensburg. I think because of the leadership of the citizens of your community, Greensburg is going to become the most appropriately named community in the United States and uh, an example to every other community that uh, wants to uh, go down a new energy path. We thank you. Uh, I now turn and recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden, for his thank, question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hewitt, I want to follow up with you on a, on a couple of points. Obviously, I know it makes sense in many cases, having been in small business 21 years, that to make an upfront investment that may be more expensive in the short term, but pay off real dividends in the long term. Can you tell me, um, based on, as you approach rebuilding Greensburg, are uh, the differential in construction costs from sort of traditional rebuilding to the, the platinum, platinum level that you're trying to achieve? What's that upfront differential? And then what's the payback period? What we're seeing at this point in time um, is that the upfront cost ranges from, in rural, well, typically it runs from 3 to 5 percent additional for, for green building upfront, and that payback is anywhere from 8 to 15 years, depending on the level. What we're seeing in rural America is that that cost is actually running closer to 10 to 15 percent and higher in some cases. Which, which, which higher, on the payback period or on the uh, construction? On the upfront, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. On the upfront cost. Uh, the payback period then will be extended out to possibly 20 years. But we, I want to make something clear is that we're not building 20-year buildings. When we talk right. about government infrastructure, we're talking infrastructure that will last 100 years, 100-year decisions. So we still see it as an excellent payback. But yes, there is a, a long-term payback and an upfront cost that's significantly higher in some cases in rural America. And then uh, let me ask you about the energy cost. If I heard you correctly, you said that you're going you're to put in wind energy generation, sell that into the grid as, as it's surplus, um, but then buy only green energy off the grid. Now, is that for everybody in the community or just the government buildings? That is for everyone in the community. We, we own the electrical utility. I see. So as we produce our wind, sell it to the grid then through a power agreement, purchase renewable energy back for our, all our citizens. And how have you been able to negotiate the, uh, the sale into the grid of the power? At what rate? And then what is your, your expected cost coming off the grid for green energy only? And will that be all wind? No, it would actually can be wind and, and some hydro as well. Um, and how we're doing that is through our local power pool. Mm -hmm. Our power pool has made a commitment they're willing to buy the wind from us. And we're currently negotiating at what rate they'll purchase that from us. And then we'll turn around and we'll purchase that back from them because they have the ability to sell us hydropower when the wind is not blowing. Um, they want to increase their renewable, renewable portfolio mm -hmm. as well as we do. So it's, it's a partnership that continues. Um, and we hope to wrap that up. And, but we feel very confident in our early negotiations that this is definitely a community wind project that can be replicated in other communities. So how many megawatts of wind power do you anticipate generating? Well, our community is a small community, uh, and we're, we're currently going to start with probably four megawatts of power uh, for a small community of uh, 1,500 people. And four megawatts will satisfy all the energy needs of your community? At this point community? in time, yes. And obviously, uh, wow. we hope to grow, but at this point, that will satisfy our needs. And, and that's the, the plate power production, not the, the firm load, right? That is, that four megawatts would handle us at a peak load. Peak load. Yeah, our, our average load before the storm is, is closer to three megawatts, but to handle larger uh, sure. flux, we will have four megawatts. Okay. And uh, so the, the power that you would purchase would be a mix of hydro and wind energy? That's correct. In the, in the Northwest, as my friend and colleague from Oregon can tell you, that's the, a lot of the mix we have, but we also, uh, with the hydro um, system that we have, it's, it's upwards of, I think, 60% uh, of our power is hydro, and then we've been very aggressive in our wind energy development, and they work well together. The hydro almost works as a battery, <coughs> pardon me, if you will, because you can store some of the water, and then when the wind isn't blowing, um, you can release a little more and, and rely on the hydro. But we still have to uh, back that up with peak generation power from natural gas and, and obviously a lot from coal. So your system wouldn't use either natural gas or coal then? That's our goal, is not to use any fossil fuel That's or coal. That's terrific. 
That's terrific. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your input and good luck in your reconstruction effort. That's a monumental task and, and a, a, a great set for uh, the rest of the country to observe and learn from. Thank you. Great. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hewitt, I just uh, wonder what your calculations are going to look like when the evidence is that oil prices are going to continue to go up. There will be costs associated with carbon. No matter who is elected president, there is an effort to control, have a carbon-constrained economy. And we are looking at utility rates uh, for gas and electricity. They are going up dramatically. I am um, wondering what your calculations are going to look like. I would be willing to bet you a lunch that the payback period is actually going to get shorter, not longer, uh, as technology is enhanced, as we are looking at models like Abu Dhabi, uh, what we are looking at in our community with the green buildings, uh, the premium that is attached to it, the payback periods appear to be getting shorter. Um, and so I am rooting for you to continue. And I deeply appreciate the Chairman's suggestion that we encourage the Federal partners uh, to get real about these opportunities, uh, particularly because you have been sort of a showpiece. But I think that it is a profound policy adjustment that we ought to explore uh, because natural disasters are escalating. Uh, we are seeing more of them here. The evidence from climate change is that, uh, that the um, horror that was visited on your community is something that we are going to be seeing more, not less, even if we start turning this carbon ship around. So, Mr. Chairman, I think this is a policy adjustment that bears uh, serious analysis, and I appreciate your bringing it forward, Mr. Hewitt. Uh, and I must say uh, that I am impressed with the model of Abu Dhabi. We are having a number of people from Oregon that are traipsing over, being part of the of the team, uh, encourage uh, the streetcar uh, as part of uh, your long-term formulation, and look forward to having a chance to accept one of the invitations we have been receiving to uh, look at it on the ground. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was somewhat uh, perplexed by uh, the, uh, uh, the testimony from Mr. Cohn, who is suggesting something that nobody is suggesting, that the United States government be some sort of mega zoning board. Uh, but instead start changing the incentives and the priorities, how we behave as a government. I have legislation that I will circulate uh, in, dra in draft form to each of the members of the committee that talks about uh, a, VM tree, a VMT land use strategy on the part of the federal government uh, to get your uh, feedback before it is introduced. Uh, because I think it is uh, absolutely not anything that you are talking about, Mr. Cohen. And I, I don't know people that are making that argument that the Federal Government, well, it is not something that we have done in Portland, Oregon, as you are well aware. We have given people choices in Oregon. Uh, but the most effective trip is the trip not taken. And if we can enhance urban environments, uh, if we can deal with the problems of small town America, everybody is going to benefit. But I will circulate that to you and each member of the committee and invite your feedback. But I wondered uh, if I could just invite comment from Mr. Goldberg or Mr. Winkleman about the federal policies that you think ought to be adjusted to be able to promote that smarter growth. Um, I mentioned the federal government and the sort of the goofiness of GSA and INS uh, locating something miles from the central city. Do you have other thoughts about policies and adjustments that would reinforce what you are saying? Well, as I mentioned, I think one of the biggest opportunities is looking at the big pot of money that we will spend on transportation infrastructure. And the zeitgeist is really to look at system performance, performance metrics. There have been a couple of national commissions looking at this set of issues. And so having greenhouse gas emission considerations be part of that, I think, is key. Also, if we are going to ask state and local governments to do something new, they need the proper tools, resources, and data and models to plan, implement, and measure. And so transportation spending is a key in, uh, influencer of land use and therefore VMT. So that is a critical part of the solution. Yeah, certainly, I, I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Blumenauer's comments, uh, uh, say, noting that no one has called for a federal mandate or federal dictate to the local government. We strongly believe in, in local home rule and in community empowerment and communities 
being able to make their own decisions about how they grow. We strongly encourage them to think ahead about that growth and not just let it happen to them. We would back up also to the post-World War II era when we came out of World War II and we, we adopted a whole lot of policies that basically put us on a path of car dependence. And we've been going along that route now for several decades. And we've, we've now reached, as the headlines I was reading to you before demonstrate, we've reached a point where that is not working anymore. And, and the federal government now can back away from some, promoting some of those, those policies and begin to support the communities that are exploring ways. In fact, the federal government already has done some of that through the EPA's Smart Growth Division, supporting communities who are exploring innovative ways to accommodate their growth in ways that make their communities stronger and that and keep and their, preserve their existing assets. Thank you, Mr. Goldberg. I would just note, Mr. Chairman, in closing, that uh, after World War II, FHA would not finance developments like the livable community that you grew up in. It was single member, de single home detached uh, uh, housing, uh, not mixed use, for instance. So we, in effect, our financing mechanism doomed people to a sprawling development pattern and the congestion that concerns Mr. Cohen's members. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Al, is it Jaber? Thank you. Uh, I, I am intrigued uh, about Mass Star City. I've, I've seen uh, shots of it from the air on, on television, and it's, it's, it's one of the most amazing uh, feats. We're going to have to, uh, Congress will, will need to pass something to have the ninth wonder uh, of the world. I'm going to introduce that bill uh, on your behalf. Um, it, it, would, it would appear to me that uh, Greenberg, Kansas may be the only city in the nation that's moving toward what you're doing. I'm just curious about the, the vision of that city and what, something you said in your, in your statement, which was, uh, I think, intriguing also, and that is that uh, this will be a platform for long-term innovation, which means this is what's being done now is not the end of, of where you're going. Is there a vision of, of, of where you ultimately will, will, will go uh, in terms of the development of Mass Star City? I mean, has someone already envisioned 2030? We have a clear objective uh, through the development of the Mass Star City. One objective is to make renewables become grid parity as soon as we can. That is one clear objective we have. Another objective is by developing the Mass Star City, we want the city to become a model that can be affordable, replicable, and transferable to other nations and other cities around the world. It will be a long-term investment, and it will be a platform for long-term innovation. What we are experiencing today is that these te the technologies that we are integrating in the Mazda City development are actually available, but they do not, with the current technologies that we have access to today in the market, do not actually achieve our objectives of making it today uh, a zero carbon emission city. But with the integration of all the technologies together, we will be able to achieve a carbon neutral city. Now, our objective is to do, by implementing these technologies, by deploying these technologies at a large scale of a city uh, like the, the Mazda city, is to make these technologies, once implemented, zero, produce zero carbon emissions from day one. That is a long-term objective, but it is something that we're very much committed in, in, uh, in developing. You, you are, uh, we have an ideological uh, uh, discussion anytime we talk about anything here in this country. You know, uh, we, we, we don't want the government to, to get involved, and, and then there's the, let's protect the businesses. Uh, your, your, uh, your country is, 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 is rich in oil, and I'm wondering if the oil barons are fighting the concept, uh, you know, saying that, uh, you know, the government is trying to tell people how to live and where to live and so forth. Uh, As a matter of fact, uh, what we are finding is phenomenal positive response and support as well as commitment uh, from the senior leadership. Uh, they see a natural extension for our involvement in the global energy market. They see a logical step for us to, to venture into this. This is considered to be a nation-building exercise that will continue uh, our environmental stewardship as well as our leadership in the global energy markets. Well, is it possible that uh, you could uh, export to our country some of your business people to conduct workshops with the big oil companies, you know, saying kumbaya, and then listen to what, uh, to listen to what, what you are experiencing? 
I, I, I'm, I'm being facetious, but in a way, I, 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 um, I, I, I'm just so awed by what's going on. And then, and then I look at what we're doing and, and the pushback we get on everything related to uh, the, 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 the real need for us to uh, change the way we live here in this country and change our policies and look toward the future. So I, I appreciate very much your presence here today. I, I apologize. I'm running back and forth between uh, committees, but I, 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 uh, before I left, to, and I will return, but I, I just had to uh, have an opportunity to discuss uh, uh, with you what, what's going on and what I think is one of the most amazing projects in the world right now. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Solis. Thank you, and I want to thank the panelists for your time and, and your uh, commitment, especially to uh, the Honorable Steve Hewitt for coming out and being so brave to, to tell us exactly what your community is doing. And um, I just wanted to mention that in the area that I represent, it's very heavily low income and struggling all the time. We almost feel like we don't have enough resources to do anything either. Um, but a lot, I, I would say, I give credit to you is political will, the courage that the residents have there and, and you in terms of foresight to see something like that happen, that renewable energy really be a part of, of the community. Um, and I've run up against some, some of our local schools who are, who are now passing bonds, using that money to restructure and restore old school buildings, but are somehow not able to utilize uh, the, the highest quality renewable uh, technology to make their, their uh, schools green. So we do have a problem with a lot of our agencies as well as some of our state and local uh, agencies that are not also flexible in terms of allowing for people to hit that gold standard. And I, I know that that's going to be a challenge for us. And you've already been asked how the federal government might be able to help, and I'm, and I'm more than happy to help do that as well. And I'm very intrigued by your thought about uh, creating green collar jobs. You know, last year the president signed into law in December a bill that would help provide for $125 million. It hasn't been appropriated yet, but it would be helping to single out communities like yours that would be eligible for funding so that we could have a pathway to careers that allow people then to come back home and actually those that want to stay there can get into a job career that provides incentives in the solar en energy area, renewable energies, biofuels and everything. And I just wonder if you're, if you're aware of that uh, as, of, as of now. You are, good. <laughs> Your mic isn't on. I wasn't aware of that exact bill, but I will uh, we'll definitely be looking into that. And we're looking for incentives to, to bring in the biofuels and the, uh, the renewable um, products that can be manufactured in our community. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And, and to Mr. Cohen, um, I didn't hear anything about some other models that have been used by the federal government. One, as of late, that uh, is trying to be imposed upon LA County and parts of San Bernardino is this whole issue of congestion pricing. I just want to get your thoughts, if you have any idea about uh, if that's one of the ways that we should be going to try to um, change behavior and uh, convert our HOV lanes to toll lanes. Uh, our, my, my your, your mic is in on. Thank you. My, my view is that we should not price existing lanes that have been paid for with taxpayer dollars, um, but that we should consider tolling and pricing for new capacity. And if you have an underutilized HIV lane, then perhaps it might be a, a better use of space to make it a hot lane and allow HIV riders to ride free and others to pay a toll as long as you keep the, the road moving. Um, but we strongly oppose the administration's efforts to toll the interstates, uh, cordon price areas of town. I, I think it's particularly uh, painful on the poor, um, those who don't have the luxury of choosing when they go to work. Um, and and uh, frankly, I, I think that the administration sometimes feels that many trips are not important but when you ask people who are taking those trips if your trip was important, they feel it was. Okay. So I, I, I would be opposed in general, okay. with some exception, to congestion pricing of our existing capacity. Thank you. Um, Mr. Al-Jabur, I uh, wanted to just ask you, um, I don't know much about the community, uh, the, the area that this uh, 
that this uh, planned renewable community has been structured, but I'd like to get an idea about what the economics are there and, and the wealth and what, uh, what revenue is being used to help sustain this and, and to provide for the growth there. I mean, where, where is that revenue coming from? Well, as you know, the, uh, the Mazda city development is being uh, seeded uh, by the government of Abu Dhabi, and we're leveraging uh, those funds with uh, international partnerships uh, through the private sector uh, companies that are interested in being part of uh, the Mazda initiative. When you now, say the government, do you mean also that oil revenue is also being used then to, to help uh, provide for this infrastructure? What better investment would we ever have uh, to invest oil revenues into uh, securing uh, the future energy? I, I would hope that that's something that other partners in the Arab uh, League would also look at and adopt. And then one question I have is uh, also the creation of opportunities for uh, people to get into these kinds of technologies. And, I, and I'm really looking more at your labor force, because you have a very growing, diverse population. And in many cases, I understand you have to import labor. Is that, is that the case here where you had to import labor to help structure this facility, or did you have ample labor force already available? Well, the construction is going to is going to happen with existing companies that are already they, that already have access to their uh, labor workforce within uh, within Abu Dhabi and the United Arab Emirates and uh, uh, the GCC countries. Um, the way the city is going to be structured is going to be very sustainable from day one, and we are building uh, our own sustainable uh, uh, labor workforce uh, housing that is going to be absolutely sustainable. Okay. I don't know if I'm over. I still have one minute. I wanted to, uh, to ask uh, Mr. Goldberg, you know, some of our smaller communities really are trying their hardest to, to focus in on smart growth. In fact, the community I'm thinking about right now is a very older uh, 1930s community that's actually uh, revitalizing two-story buildings that, were, uh, that have now been reinforced. They were brick actually, which isn't great for California because of earthquakes, but they've been able to restructure that and really create kind of a transit and more mobile uh, community for seniors. Have you seen, uh, can you maybe elaborate on some of those schemes that have actually been, been working well and, and how are they able to, to negotiate um, zoning and things like that? And sometimes you get a whole lot of folks that say, Nim, you know, NIMBY, I don't want this to happen. I don't want more people coming into my community. Well, it's a, it, it can be difficult many times for, uh, for developers, and many developers around the country are trying to, to help these, these areas revitalize and to become more, more walkable and to meet this demand that I mentioned before. Uh, we do have, uh, in, in many places, we have a, a set of zoning codes that was, was actually act, actively promulgated by the federal government back at last century that um, mandates the separation of uses that says that the houses go over here, apartments go over here, or maybe they're not even allowed. Uh, shopping goes over here, schools and businesses right. are completely separated so that we have to drive from one to the other. And actually it, it can take a series of variances and, and many, many meetings and many opportunities for the community to, to speak out in order to, to get these changes done. What, what has worked very well in many communities is, is to think ahead and to, and to say our, the, the denser development, the walkable neighborhoods, they go here and here's how we want them to look. And, and over here, if it's a, a single-family neighborhood that we don't want to change, it stays that way. Mm -hmm. So then developers know where to go, and you make it easier for them to do what you, what you consider to be the right thing. And the icing on the cake is if you also happen to have the, the transit investment there that makes it really work for people. Right. Thank you. I would also like to ask Mr. Uh, our next speaker, um, Steve, if you could maybe elaborate also, uh, Mr. Winkleman. Uh, Thank you. I think regarding I smart growth, I mean, because it's it's something that's very timely. In fact, the California State Legislature is proposing giving out special funding for targeted communities who integrate the transit villages and smart growth. And I just want to get your reaction to that. If, what, what other states are doing that? I mean, I, know, I think Oregon is, uh, Oregon has, and others that are innovative. But what, what can we do to help incentivize some of our, our states? 
Thank you. Well, actually, a couple months ago, I testified to the California Air Resources Board on this set of issues. They come to the same set of conclusions as I lay out in my graphs that basically you can't get here, can't get there from here without dealing with vehicle miles traveled. And one of the points, going to your last question to David, in terms of local zoning, gov local governments need tools to change zoning. They may have one person in a zoning office who needs model code, who needs some help to do things that people want, and to engage the community to understand this. If we really want to do this, we need to provide the right tools and resources. And so there's a host of uh, policy measures that can help, ranging from local, state, and regional. California has these blueprint planning grants focusing on uh, starting from the Sacramento region's planning efforts, but where a community does a visioning process and says, how can our community grow? And what will that mean for things that people care about? Congestion, air quality, how much they spend on fuel. And one of the interesting things, if we look at costs and how the federal government will spend money on climate change, I calculate for the Sacramento region, negative $200 per ton CO2 from their smart growth policies. This compares negative cost means that it's a net savings for society. Reduce infrastructure costs, reduce costs. Mm -hmm. If you look at carbon capture and storage, $30 a ton, ethanol, $200 a ton. So if we ask the climate question for new things that we build or plan and say, what does that do to emissions, we'll get very far and find common sense solutions that actually can reduce um, costs. Do, do either of you uh, have an idea of how this model would work in, say, low income and depressed communities that are really, really on the edge there and may not, uh, you know, if there are any models out there where you've seen this, this change, this uh, metamorphosis that has actually taken place. I mean, because that's really, I think, something that a lot of members of Congress are trying to grasp. And how can we revitalize our low income communities that continue to, you know, kind of be out, on, out there on the edge and not really having the tools uh, to prepare for this? Well, uh, a couple of things need, need to happen. One is that we've, we have had a tradition of, of isolating people in, in areas of low, in, of low income people isolated in areas of poverty. And um, we've, we have, I think, begun to address a lot of those, a lot of the policies that caused that to happen, but we haven't addressed them all. And one of them is, is the, the habit of, of zoning out people from, uh, from certain areas and not, not building the kinds, not allowing to be built the kinds of housing that would, would support them. But the other aspect is, is giving them access to jobs, making sure that they have the, the transportation that actually works for them. That, that means that they don't have to, have to own and maintain a car or multiple cars in a low-income household to be able to get around. So there almost has to be a plan overall that integrates all that so that there is, uh, it is built in, it is built in from, from the beginning. But we're, we're seeing around the, around the country, you know, so much demand now for, for closer in housing that we're going to have to figure out some really creative ways to provide housing that's affordable, not, not just to low-income people, but also for, to teachers and firefighters right. and people mm -hmm. who are making working-class wages. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, oh, did you want to comment, Mr. Cohen? Thank you. I appreciate it. Let, let me provide a different view. Um, you mentioned that a lot of people don't like to see their area densify. I was recently at a Senate uh, briefing, Mr. Winkleman was there with me, and the Smart Growth uh, survey that, uh, or community experience has been that people don't like sprawl and people don't like densification. And the problem is that those are the two options that are provided. Um, so I, I admire the, the Smart Growth community in using terms like Smart Growth, sprawl for bad things, but the reality is that communities also, when they understand the densification, the congestion that could come from their plans, uh, are not happy with those. The other issue you mentioned was low-income communities, and another reality is that smart growth communities, many, are extremely unaffordable, um, and this is a very serious problem with smart growth development. It might be cool to live in a community that with you know, mixed-use housing and, and be able to buy your latte and bike to it, but these communities typically are priced out of range for folks who uh, you're wanting to serve. I, I think that's going to be our challenge because we do want to integrate all our communities, especially communities of color. We want to create jobs. We want to create incentives so that, so that there is a clean environment for them, and they should not be shortchanged is on, on any of this. So some of us feel very strongly about that, and we'll work very hard to see that the models are, can be replicated everywhere, and especially in rural communities as well, where access and affordability also is, is, uh, 
is a high is a high uh, standard. But I think that I think it can all be done. I really do believe that we can we can start addressing the issue. And and because of energy costs, people want to stay closer to where they work and live. So that's forcing behavior to change right now in in my state of California. That's all I can tell you. You know, uh, I I appreciate. Uh, what you are uh, saying in that regard. One of the things that you run into problems is that you have to link transportation and housing costs together. And in California, you've had people move further and further and further away, um, and they may save a little on housing, but they end up paying more in total because they spend so much time and money in transportation. And so it, I think part of what uh, the, uh, the smart growth advocates are talking about is integrating those pieces together. Um, and if we actually have communities that are well planned and integrated, it actually can re end up reducing total costs for people. Uh, I uh, was listening to Mr. Uh, Cohen's uh, comment. Uh, I've had the same experience where uh, in these big planning meetings, you find people are opposed to only two things, sprawl and density. Uh, but I also find that when you, uh, in the planning like you have in Abu Dhabi or you're talking about doing uh, um, in uh, Greensburg, when it's put together in a way that is reasonable, uh, people love it. Uh, and uh, the, uh, notwithstanding Mr. Cohen's uh, concerns, in our community, the most valuable real estate uh, is those areas that have Re, have re, uh, regained their historic population levels. Most communities, in yours and mine, actually have far fewer people than they had a generation ago. What we've got is two or three times more cars, so that people uh, have the congestion on the, on the roads, they have the traffic, they're concerned. Uh, it's not the people, it's the cars. And the real estate market suggests that those are, in fact, the most valuable areas. Um, if you're not, if you're done, I'm going to go to my last, just the last couple of questions to the panel before we adjourn, uh, because I I do think uh, that it is uh, important for us to think about this uh, comprehensively, in ways that we give people choices. We haven't talked about the demographic shock wave that is about to hit our communities. We quote. Uh, in our uh, survey here, uh, Dr. Uh, Chris Nelson, uh, who uh, has some other fascinating research that talks about how our households, some of us grew up in the Leave it to Beaver era where half the families had children, we're going into an era in by 2030 when there will be more single person households than families with children. And uh, the impact that that's going to have is one that um, uh, I think uh, is uh, worthy of our consideration. I would like to invite our uh, panelists to move away from the transportation side of the equation when we're dealing with smart growth. I appreciated the experience in, in Abu Dhabi. You're talking about being a net producer of energy and uh, reduce or recycle the water um, we're finding in communities across the country um, just as much concern about the rise in gas prices is the utility costs, uh, the uh, line loss for electric power extension, uh, the costs for, uh, for water, uh, gas transmission are all going up. Uh, I'm curious if there are observations, we can just go down the row here, of our witnesses about the impacts that we're going to have um, with saving land, because if we don't start having more compact development in this country, we're going to take another 68 million acres that'll give us a, a developed footprint in this country about the size of Texas if we don't change things. And I wonder if we can start with our smart growth advocates and go down and conclude uh, with uh, the Greensburg notion of what you're doing with the footprint and land utilization, if you wouldn't mind. Footprint, water, and energy. I, th I think one thing that we're, we're going to find is that we really don't have the luxury of developing 80% of our commercial area in, as parking. 
anymore, that uh, surface parking, that that land, that land, taking the land for that, for that particular use, it's, it's terrible for the watershed, it creates herb, it exacerbates urban heat islands, and it's, a, and it's a big waste. And in fact, in fact, I think we're going to see that recycling parking lots, redeveloping these old shopping centers into places that are actually uh, you know, inhabitable villages is going to be one of the, one of the big solutions that we'll find. And, and, and just to, if we just go out on the orange line and look at Arlington, they were able, to, with advanced planning, to, to get the community together and support what would happen around those transit stations out there and leave the single family neighborhoods alone. And they, they got development that they wanted where they wanted it, and they were able to keep the other places the way they wanted them, and with, with the result that there is significantly less traffic than anybody thought there would be because they're mar managing the parking very well. And that, the, that in just 7% of the land area, they're receiving about a third or more of their tax revenues. So this can be a win on several different levels. Thank you. Thank you. I commend the organization of this panel because when you talk about smart growth, what gets built are buildings. And if we look at the climate change issue, we talk about mitigation, reducing emissions, and then adaptation. How do you start to increase your resilience to the impacts? And when we look at green buildings, those issues really come together. You have the efficiency savings from transportation, building energy use, building water use savings, and then when you integrate green roofs, building materials, you can start to mitigate the uh, impacts of urban heat islands. And so it's really looking at how these issues come together to make us more resilient to the impacts of climate change. And we are, CCAP runs an Urban Leaders Adaptation Initiative working with communities around the country to find where are those overlaps between energy and greenhouse gas emission reductions and measures that strengthen communities' impacts to the uh, uh, resilience to the impacts of climate change, whether it's the flooding we're seeing in the Midwest now or the fires in California. Great. Thank you. Um, are the, all of these things are nice things, and they all cost money. The reality is we have to look at them on a cost per carbon reduced basis. If that's the goal, if the goal is to maximize the amount of carbon we can reduce with the dollars we have, then we can do a lot of these things. Uh, so I think that's a really important thing, to focus on not the things that are cool, but the things that we're getting the most bang for our buck. And some of these ideas probably fit in within these IPCC's recommended estimate of $50 per cost, $50 per ton removed. So I think if we focus on those things, we can do a lot. Uh, I don't agree, respectfully, that we have a land shortage in the country or that we should ration land. And while I don't have my statistics with me, I would be happy to provide for the record information on land available in this country. But I, I think we might just uh, uh, disagree and, and, and respectfully at that. Right. I would welcome that. Uh, it's not a shortage of land. It's going back to your criterion about effective development in terms of the cost and consequences uh, for the utility lines, for the pollution, for the congestion, uh, for taking away other infrastructure investments for the movement of freight. So I welcome your assessment of land, but it is, it is things that, we're, uh, that have environmental uh, and real life consequences to continue paving. So if you'd put them both together, I would appreciate it. Doctor? I'm sorry. As far as we're concerned, we're very much aligned with your thoughts. Uh, but let, me, let us go back to Abu Dhabi as an example. A couple of years ago, Abu Dhabi announced uh, the launch of the new Abu Dhabi 2030 urban plan. And it is simply an urban uh, framework structure that will uh, implement <clears throat> A new criteria for the new developments in Abu Dhabi. Now, in order for Abu Dhabi to continue its planned growth and in order for Abu Dhabi to continue meeting its energy requirements, we have no, cha no, no way of doing it except by us being able to be more energy efficient and conserve energy and develop cities that, that are more compact. Let's go back in time. 200 years ago, when we had no access to oil, no access to the wealth we have, we have access to today, our grand-grand-grand-grandparents, how did they live? They lived very, very, very efficiently. Their homes were very compact, they were very close to each other, narrow streets, all shadowed, uh, automatic uh, or uh, automated air conditioning through this Bargil, uh, Bargil architecture structure. Now, we're not saying let's, let's go back and, uh, and 
revisit the way we used to build our cities before, but we have to be very energy efficient, we have to conserve energy, and we have to conserve water, and we can use that as a, as a model for us moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. When we went through our comprehensive master plan, which is very important, planning in a comprehensive way is, is the right thing to do. We talked about land use. Land use is very important. Our footprint as a community, um, it'd be very easy for people to begin to add uh, many lots and expand their properties, and that is actually against our comprehensive um, plan. We, we think that the, the density and the c connectivity of a community is very important. Without that, you're, you're, you're fragmented, and that, that struggles with parks and schools. We understood that our footprint of our current community can handle much more growth than we ever had before if we, if we plan correctly. So your smart growth methods are exactly the right d decisions for Greensburg because Greensburg is not just looking at long-term planning that deals with future decisions, but the future of the present decisions, and that's important to us. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hewitt, uh, we've been working for years to try to get Congress and America to move in the direction that your community has. And we as a country don't have the luxury uh, of a tornado. We, we don't have this sort of life-altering event. We just have this slow, long-term collapse of the, the climatic system of the Earth to deal with. We don't have this, I hate to think of a tornado as a cleansing thing because you had such disaster but it apparently did give you a chance to change the direction of your community. Can you just give us any thoughts that you know, we can share with our colleagues about what insights this whole experience gave you and your community that you might not have had but for that disaster? I, it's sometimes hard to believe that a, an opportunity can come from such a devastating um, event. However, though, in our decisions, we understand that the, um, the world is watching us and the decisions we're making as a community hopefully can be replicated. So that's one of the biggest issues we have battled is, is that what happens to communities that don't have devastation, that are just surviving, but want to thrive and, and revitalize their community. One of the things we see is education. In, in green building and sustainability, you have to educate, which is a struggle in rural, rural America, especially in rural Kansas, is educating contractors, um, suppliers, engineers, architects, that you have to step outside the box of your normal routine um, and, and think about educating and, and connecting people and, and collaborating together so that the growth and sustainability uh, rebuild of our community can be replicated in a community that says, okay, we're going to build the new city hall. Um, we have the tax dollars saved up from all these years. How do we do it in our budget? How, where can we find the information about it? How can we do things? from all infrastructure to schools to hospitals. We're hoping that what we're doing in rural America in Kansas right now can be uh, a st one step forward in an education process so that communities can revitalize themselves um, without a disaster happening. So I know a home builder uh, in my community, it's actually my oldest son, if he wants to come do volunteer work to learn how to do some green building in his community, can he do that? Absolutely. We would love to bring anybody out to learn from our, from our stakes, from our successes, from our growing experiences that hopefully the builders, like I said, builders, contractors, suppliers, architects can hopefully take something back to their community and see that this is a good thing for them. Are you receiving any sort of additional federal assistance because of this, this green commitment that you've made? No. We're actually... Uh, we have larger gaps because we're going this direction, and we've been told by some agencies that they will not fund the level of sustainability that we want to go towards. So given your extraordinary commitment, wouldn't it make some sense for the U.S. to look at this as a, as a test case and have a little federal help for you uh, along this way? We think it would be a perfect test case, and we would encourage um, all government agencies, schools, hospitals to take a hard look at what we're doing because we do believe um, it is the future that's um, in smart and rebuilding. We know the fellow to your right, um, Dr. Al-Jabbar from Abu Dhabi, they, they've sort of made this test case city and we've got this really impressive brochure that I've, I've taken a look at. It just seems to me that the United States 
ought to be able to make a, a smaller, a much smaller commitment in the heart of Kansas, like uh, this project in Abu Dhabi. I'd like to talk to you when this is over, maybe about a thought about that. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jabir, this is kind of interesting. Your presence here is timely. We have a debate in this country right now. Some think that our answer to our energy woes is just drill more. You just drill more holes, you just drill more oil and gas wells, and that'll solve the problem. We have this debate right now in Congress about that. Why hasn't Abu Dhabi, sitting where it is, made that decision? Why have you decided to go a different route? Abu Dhabi is looking at it from a different perspective. In order for the world to be able to meet its uh, energy requirements, we believe in a basket of solutions. Hydrocarbons will play a role, but renewables is also going to be, to, to be able to play a very important role. We, we're, we're very much supporters of the world looking at it from a different angle now. It's no longer one or the other. It is a basket of solutions and it's a portfolio of energy sources. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'll echo your comments in our next speech. Thank you very much. The chair would uh, forgive me. I want to ask Mr. Cohen. Uh, I want to brag because Mr. Blumenauer is too humble about his hometown of Portland. Uh, Portland became, I think, the first major city to reduce its vehicle miles per person driven in America's history, and I think that happened in 2007. And they did it through a combination of good uh, planning, which includes some uh, very, uh, very nice density, uh, public uh, transportation, and just a very coordinated approach to try to reduce vehicle miles driven per person. Um, did they do anything wrong? I think that, respectfully, that, that they did. Um, for a number of reasons. One is that they created a, a growth boundary around the town that increased the price uh, of, of land. Um, and even though carbon per capita was reduced, as I mentioned in my testimony, congestion greatly increased because when you double density and you reduce per capita VMT by, say, 20 percent, you're still increasing congestion. So I think that's a concern, and that also increases the cost of living. Um, secondly, you know, there is sort of a, a theory, I think an idealistic theory, that, you know, if we just went back 80 years and we lived in smaller communities with streetcars and everyone lived close together, that this would be a terrific way of life. As Billy Joel said, the good old days weren't always good, and tomorrow ain't as bad as it seems. The suburban development that we've had created the prosperity in this country, the interstate system created the prosperity in this country that has given us the wealth able to make the air quality and water quality progress that we have made in the last 30 years. So just going back to the way things were with a revisionist idea of how ideal it was, I think is seriously problematic and there's a lot of unintended consequences that we're not considering when we think in terms of pictures like that. Well, I'll just tell you the view from up the I-5 uh, corridor, uh, Portland, has had the most extraordinary success creating a livable community, attractive to all, that people are dying to get into to live in. And if this congested area you're talking about is seen as essentially an urban nirvana compared to most of the cities in the country, I don't know when you've been to Portland recently, but you won't have a nicer Saturday afternoon than strolling and using public transportation in Portland, Oregon. You ought to come out, especially in July or August. I, I, when the rain is warmer. Yes, when the rain is warmer, yes. I just, uh, refer Mr. Cohen to the Texas Transportation Institute where, our, according to them, our congestion is not getting worse, Con that proportionately it has actually been reduced compared to other countries, other major cities. So I'd like to have your experience about how your assertion that our urban growth boundary has increased congestion when places that don't have urban growth boundaries have had worse congestion, according to my information from the Texas Transportation Institute. I'd like your evidence to back up your assertion. The second point I would make for your uh, observation is that land prices uh, were maintained, but housing prices are, have been more affordable than most of other major cities. And in this recent collapse, when people are worried about not being able to 
sell their homes for what they're worth, their mortgages are, that we've maintained housing values. They haven't been as high elsewhere, but they've, main, they've been maintained. They haven't been on the roller coaster like in uh, Las Vegas, which I would imagine you would think would be one of the best places. So I'd like your evidence to the contrary about the congestion. I'd like you to look at the Texas Transportation Institute and then look at what has happened actually with home values, um, because my uh, evidence is uh, slightly different than yours, and I'd like your evidence to the contrary to be a part of the record. Thank you. Uh, oh, the last word, Mr. Wilkerman? When, Thank you. If, if we look at congestion, that's not we care about people more than we care about cars. And so exposure to congestion is a metric that the Sacramento region has used. If you have more transportation choices, shorter trips, you spend less time in that congestion. I also want to make the point that the State Department of Transportation across the country have an association called ASTRA, the Association of State Highway Transportation Officials. They say, they conclude that we have to cut VMT growth in half to deal with growing capacity needs. We can't build our way out. There's not enough money. So they're actually supportive of smart growth principles as well as system efficiency improvements to make the best use of existing infrastructure and take into account existing financial considerations. Great. Thank you. I, I, I would just also like to briefly notice somebody who lives in Atlanta and has for a long time and followed the growth and development there that there are absolutely no constraints to growth in Atlanta. The growth has gone absolutely everywhere. That they've built roads like mad and it, and it can, continues. It's the lowest density major metro area in the country and it continues to move up the congestion ranks nevertheless. Um, and then there are issues of energy consumption and a whole host of things. Well, uh, I appreciate the committee's uh, uh, indulgence. Um, I appreciate your kind words of, uh, in defense of our uh, beleaguered uh, upper left coast region. Um, we appreciate the panel joining with us and adding an important dimension uh, to the, the land use BMT um, planning consumption uh, uh, element of this. I think it's very useful and, and your contributions um, have been uh, very helpful, particularly given the sort of the bookends that we've had with Abu Dhabi and Greensburg. It's, uh, it's uh, inspiration. Thank you very much.